Friday at 5. Yay! Together we're making it through week 24 of the pandemic, and we're glad to have you joining us this evening. I'm Doris Cooper, part of the family who lives and works here at Cooper Garrett Estate Vineyards. Behind the camera is my husband, Bill, our winemaker, and chatting with all of you online tonight is our niece, Corey, who's our tasting room club and events manager. It's been a very busy week around here, and you might enjoy a behind the scenes report about what it's like to live in a vineyard right now. As we get started though, what's in your glass right now? Since it's been such a week, is it spirits or a mixed drink? We have one daughter safe from the LNU complex fires in Sonoma County who just might be pouring some bourbon to cap off her smoke-filled week. Or in your glass, is it a nice California wine? Perhaps a Cooper Garrett even? We're going to pour the 2014 Cabernet Sauvignon from two vineyards tonight. Since we're talking about this week of living in a vineyard. Or in your glass, is it sparkling water tonight? We have another daughter who may have sparkling water in her glass. She wishes that it were sparkling wine to celebrate Houston being spared the rages of Hurricane Laura, but her little family packed a big U-Haul moving truck there today. They're relocating to Denver, away from hurricanes, but going to snow country. And since they will be hitting the road very early tomorrow morning, well, water may be all that's left tonight for her instead. So I'm pouring this one for you guys tonight, Goose. The two vineyards are our Valley View and Lone Oak vineyards. They're our highest and steepest on our acreage. Let's see what we have. Wow. This is a gorgeous, deep red, carmen color in the glass. That's beautiful. Mm. On the nose, I'm picking up some cherries, maybe some plums, and a little bit of soft, kind of well-worn leather. You know, like a nice saddle or that leather purse that you've had forever and just love. delicious cassis in here. Oh my gosh. Dark, dark, dark cherry. Really ripe plums. Sort of the purplish kind of plums, not the yellow ones, but the really nice purple ones. There's still some rich leather in here. And there's a little soft little hint of nice pipe tobacco too. <coughs> Excuse me and it's a nice fine finish that's lingering. Wow, I'm glad we chose two vineyards for this vineyard evening. What's something easy that you could have to go with it? Chocolate bark with almonds. You line a baking sheet with parchment. So the first thing you do, line your baking sheet with parchment. You take a cup of onions onions, what am I saying, almonds, a cup of almonds, and you put them in a nice freezer baggie, and then you crunch them up on the counter with a meat mallet or something like that. So you've got the parchment lime sheet. These are all crunched up now in your freezer baggie. You take a bag of nice semi-sweet chocolate chips, and you melt them. I like to do it in the microwave. It's very, very easy. You can do it on a stove top as well. In the microwave, you just kind of go and maybe start with a minute first, stir, and then go with 30 second increments. 
because you don't want to over zap it. It sort of separates out. You just want it nice and melty. Stir it up in between. When that's finished, you add a teaspoon of vanilla. You put in a half teaspoon of sea salt, but I didn't have any. I had kosher salt. That works fine too. Add your crunched up almonds. Stir that all together and spread it out on your parchment lined sheet. I like to sprinkle a little more sea salt on top of it. And sometimes with that, I've taken a strip of wax paper and kind of pressed the salt in a little bit. Put all of that in the freezer for about 30 minutes, bring it back out, break it up, and you're there. It's a nice little recipe from a website blog called Lemons and Zest. So you've got wine, you have something easy and nice to go along with it. This week's shout outs will continue to go to the more than 14,600 firefighters that are battling over two dozen fires and combined lightning strike complexes throughout our entire state of California. And a shout out also goes to all the first responders who are going into the communities that were struck so hard by Hurricane Laura. And we also want to give a shout out to all of the relief workers who are tending to displaced families, some of whom no longer have a home to go back to. And we also want to give a shout out to all the compassionate human beings who are contributing in material and monetary ways to directly aid recovery efforts, which will be going on for some time to come still. So yes, part of living in a vineyard now, right now, can be uncertainty. In the Santa Cruz Mountains, we know that McHenry Vineyards lost their winery facility with all of its equipment and their 2018, 2019 vintages, plus their home. Their vineyard is intact, albeit with some damage, most likely around the edges where the fire would try to encroach. We also know that the winery facility at Big Basin Vineyards made it through, as did their vineyards, but their home is gone. The winery and family homes at Beauregard are still standing, and their vineyards made it through with minimal damage but this year's crop from those vines may well be lost. There are other vineyard and winery colleagues who don't yet have reports about their properties. So our hearts remain with our own family in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Scotts Valley evacuees have been allowed to return home, but the power, the water, the road infrastructures in the rest of the evacuated areas are not yet restored or stable enough for other places to do so. If you're wondering how to help, well, one way is to buy Santa Cruz Mountains wines. We have a hashtag, Santa Cruz Mountains Strong, because mountain wineries are a community. And together, we will all help one another and we'll get through this time. And as things sort out, we'll know more about our neighbors on the other side of the hill. Another part of living in a vineyard right now is something, it's a question that's already being bantied about, and I won't shy away from it. Will the 2020 California vintage be known for smoke taint? Well, that's all going to depend on vineyard locations and to some extent, the grape varietal and how thick those berry skins are. UC Davis has ongoing research into the topic. Heightened by the 2017 and ensuing fires in Napa and Sonoma counties. And the Australian Wine Research Institute also has research on it, given the fires down under from the past few years. For our property, here are the things I can tell you. We've had a few smoky days to be sure, but we've also had clearer and clearer ones. In general, we talk
talk about the warm days of our valley side location and the cool nights we have with the ocean influence. Right now, with that marine influence, the morning humidities in our microclimate have been as high as 94%. Early in the growing season, that gives us cause to monitor mildew control big time. But since we dry farm, it's something that we enjoy a little bit later in the season. It keeps those chlorophyll leaves refreshed and going as the grapes are ripening. And with the fires, it's also tamped down much of the smokiness at our place. And part of the Australian research that we're finding very interesting has to do with the freshness of the smoke. In one of the coastal vineyards there, some fire smoke blew off the coast over the ocean. A few days later, the winds changed direction and that old smoke blew back in over the vineyard. And then things sort of resolved themselves. The fires and the smoke were no longer immediately present. The wine made from those grapes did not have smoke taint, but wine made from some of the grapes that had fresh smoke lingering over them for a few days did. Because the non-tainted wine in its instance sort of mirrors ours here we are very much encouraged. So when you read general reports down the road about the 2020 California vintage, remember that no one single overview applies to the entire vintage statewide. It's really going to depend on location and varietal. Speaking of varietals, another part of living in the vineyard this week is giving you an update on Harvest and Crush. You may recall that our first picking was Pinot Noir last Thursday. I'm happy to report that the native field yeast kicked in just like they're supposed to, and fermentation is going nicely in our small tanks. Every day, there's a pump over. And I don't know if you can hear, but behind me right now, there's a little And that's the pump that's working right now even. Why do we do pump overs? Because we do a whole berry fermentation for the Pinot Noir. The entire bunch goes into the fermentation tank. And when the grape's sugar converts to alcohol, CO2 is released. And that pushes up the grape skins to the top of the tank. But you want to extract color and tannins from the skins, right? So, Here's what you do. I have a, a small uh, replica to show you here. So let that be your tank, and this is the lid. And you're gonna do a pump over, is what you're gonna do. So you lift the lid. We have it on a pulley kind of a thing. And you put a big bin in front of the tank. And Trevor gets a little spigot, a spout kind of a thing that goes at the bottom of the tank. And it's gonna put wine from the bottom. It's gonna come out into the bin. But you're gonna put a little screen there because we've done whole berry fermentation, right? And so you may have some seeds or skins or something that are gonna come out and you don't want them to clog up the pump and the hose. So the wine's gonna come out it's going to go through your little screen into the bin. And obviously, you're not going to let the bin overflow with the wine. So just imagine that the lid is suspended up here. And you're going to pump the wine with the hose to come back up to the top of the tank. Okay? And it's going to actually come through a little spray thing, kind of like this. And it comes up and the little spray arm goes around while the wine is pumping and the spray thingy just goes around and around and around. So you've, you've got the wine circling in the sprinkler and it's perched across the rim at the top of the tank, okay? And it's going around and around. 
And think of it kind of like your long sprinkler that circulates around, except the liquid is going down into the tank instead of up into the air like you're watering a yard. And the pump over pushes the skins, which we call the cap, once the CO2 has helped it rise to the top. We call it the cap. And the wine that's being pumped over helps push those skins back down in, and it gets mixed up again. All the stuff gets mixed up, and it keeps fermenting. So then you take the parts that came out on the screen, and you dump them back into the top of the tank, because you want all that goodness, ultimately, to go into your wine, right? And as fermentation goes on, there's less and less of the stuff that comes out into the screen, and you just end up with wonderful wine. All of that totally delicious stuff makes it the great summer sipper that Pinot Noir can be and going into fall. So that's pump overs. And the, the pump stopped. You may notice the absence of the <coughs> now. Okay, and when you live in a vineyard, there's always one day that you wake up and the grapes are on the vine but when you have dinner that evening, bunches aren't there anymore. Jan and Betsy live in our gravel ridge vineyard and they no longer have grapes hanging on the vines around them now because the Chardonnay harvest started on Tuesday. And the winemaking process for Chardonnay is somewhat different than what I described for the Pinot Noir. Instead of fermenting clusters in the tank, we take all of the picking bins, the grapes themselves are dumped straight into the press, right out of the picking bin. And we gently squeeze the juice out by inflating our bladder press. It's like a balloon inside that we gently inflate so it presses against the grapes and squeezes out the juice. And that is taken straight away into a tank where it settles overnight. We watch for fermentation to take hold, again, from our native field yeast. And when it is, then we're going to barrel it down. The hoses run straight from the tank all the way to the barrels in the barrel room. And that's where it's barrel fermented and aged, sur lee. The lee is spelled L-I-E-S. It's a fun little French word. And whereas we do pump overs on the red wines, mixing the skins and all that back in, our white wines are not on the skins because we pressed off the juice straight away. But there may be tiny pieces of fruit particulates in there, and that kind of stuff and the products of fermentation become what we call the leaves. Now, fermenting whites still generate CO2, and that has to go somewhere. So instead of closing the barrels with a solid rubber bung, we put on what we call a fermentation lock. And this does have a rubbery piece, like a big cork that goes into the bung hole, but it has a glass outer shell with a lid and a little tube that comes up the middle. So as the CO2 bubbles up, if it were just the gas escaping, the gas could go on its own. But it actually bubbles up, and bubbles have a wall to them, don't they? In this case, it's part of the wine. So as this bubbles up, it comes up through the tube, hits the top of the fermentation lock, and that allows the gas to leave but the wine itself comes back down the sides of the fermentation lock and can go back into the barrel. So while all of this is bubbling away, we are not losing any of the precious wine, nor are we exposing it to any more oxygen and air than we would ever intend to. So that's kind of what happens. It reminds me of my mom and dad, the fermentation lock, reminds me of my mom and dad's coffee percolator back in the day where it'd go and you'd have that little jingle. Um, I don't remember which type of coffee it was, but I remember the jingle. So there you know about the 
efficacy of the ad. It may have been Folgers, because that's what mom and dad drank. Anyway, um, but it's different than making coffee now if you're going to drip it or press it or the steamed versions. But that's kind of what's happening now because we're barreling down for the Chardonnay. And when you're living in a vineyard and it's time to barrel down, well, you need to have all of your barrels, including the new ones that we ordered back in May so that they could get shipped in containers from the various French barrel houses. And when your last name is Cooper and your family business is a winery, it's always kind of funny to talk about the Cooperages, which are the barrel houses or the barrel makers. But you may remember me talking about washing barrels after bottling the end of July. Well, we always have a few brand new ones that are coming into the mix also. The ones from Marcinet and Nadalier were already delivered here, but we have some from other cooperages too. And we wanted some of the Chardonnay to go into a certain Sirug barrel. So Bill drove a pickup truck to Napa this morning to fetch those. And the rest of the Sirug and the Ramon barrels will get delivered next week in a regular bigger truck, and then we'll be complete for the season, everything under our roof right here. And when you live in a barrel, it just might be time to prepare the September wine club. If you live in a barrel, my head's in a barrel. When you live in a vineyard, it just might be time to prepare the September club release. I'll be writing tasting notes for those wines and using Bill as my guinea pig to try out what I think will be a pretty neat paired recipe for this shipment. Something a little different and seasonal coming your way in a couple of weeks if you're a club member. So that's kind of the right now with those of us who live in a vineyard at Cooper Berry. And it won't be long before we pick the Viognier either. If you've ever read a children's book called if you give a mouse a cookie, I have to say, that's kind of what I felt like putting this together for you tonight. When you live in a vineyard, here's what happens. So maybe it will turn into a book one of these days. There's this weekend, and then there's Labor Day weekend. So if you haven't already gotten your at-home summer dinner party kit, don't wait any longer. There's Viognier, Chardonnay, our Cote Roti style F-104 Starfighter, and there's Cabernet Franc. Each of them paired with a recipe so that you can treat yourself to an hors d'oeuvre, a salad, an entree, and a dessert, all paired for your own dinner party at home. Order online at cgv.com wines, and it can be for delivery straight to your door or porch side pickup here at the winery. And although our patio was closed last weekend because of the CZU fire, we will be open this weekend to welcome you for a relaxing hour and a half reservation. Santa Clara County still requires reservations for wine tasting, but that's easy to do at cgv.com slash reopening or go to the toolbar at the top of the web page, click visit, and you'll have visit our patio. That'll get you going too. Both days, you can enjoy a tasting, wine by the glass or bottle, and small bites of cheeses, crackers, and charcuterie from the tasting room refrigerator. Spike's Bites returns on Sunday, and you can pre-order their tasting meal when you make your reservation online. This week, it's their popular fried chicken and waffles, or fried paneer and waffles, if that's your vegetarian option, and both come with a side of coleslaw and a cookie. So we'll look forward to welcoming you on the patio if you're local, or again next Friday at five, when we get together once more for happy hour, no matter where you're located. Until then, stay safe. Wash hands and wear your mask, and drink nice wines. Cheers.